Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the December 8th final council meeting for the City of Oshkosh in 2020. And we'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Cassie? Crosby? Mugrower? Here. Erickson? Here. Special? And here, present six. And Councilmember Pesha will be joining us a little bit later. Councilmember Allison Asby will be um, leading us in the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As we gather tonight, we are grateful for the good things that have come to this city. May our decisions always be ones that are for the well-being of all whom we govern. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of, America, of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible liberty, and liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, first off, we have a presentation by the Winnebago County Overdose Fatality Review Team. Uh, Stephanie Gildevan and Jennifer Skolaski join us. Hello. Good evening. Welcome. Wait until our presentation is shown. Oh, it gave away the, the words that I was going to say right out of my mouth. First of all, thank you very much to the council and city staff for giving us this opportunity to share about the good work that our OFR team is doing. Um, we have a limited time and we have a lot of information to get through, but I just want to make a point that if you have any follow-up questions or need to contact Stephanie and I afterwards, we can share contact information. Uh, one other point. I will be saying OFR a lot, and that stands for Overdose Fatality Review, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So next slide, please. To introduce ourselves first, I'd like to say my name is Jennifer Sklasky, and I am the OFR facilitator. Hi, I'm Stephanie Gildenvand. I'm the Community Health Strategist at Winnebago County Health Department, and I help support uh, the fatality review and the grant that we hold that supports it. Excellent. Next slide, please. please. So a little background on the OFRs. The main purpose of our work is to prevent overdose. So that means every conversation, discussion, recommendation we have is focused on how we can prevent overdose fatalities. We do this through reviewing cases of fatal overdoses in Winnebago County and not only looking at the individual's death, but holistically at the person's entire life and journey and how our community could have done better. Next slide, please. Our OFR started in March of 2018 by being awarded a grant from the Department of Justice and Wisconsin Department of Health Services with technical assistance from Medical College of Wisconsin. The Winnebago County Drug and Alcohol Coalition, which is now considered breakwater, applied for the grant and was a major reason why we received it. Next slide, please. A huge part of the success and reason we got the grant is because of our team. Um, some of the partners that are here today are represented on this team list. It has grown a lot since 2018, and we're a multi-sector team, including our coalition, Breakwater, the law enforcement at all levels, healthcare, public health, human services, child welfare, treatment, recovery, education, and communities, all included. We have 45 partners representing 36 different agencies. Next slide, please. So what are some of the specifics? Because I know this council is very interested in the data. So overdose deaths have been consistently growing since 2001. Even though we saw a decrease in 2019, overdoses remain high, and we expect an increase in 2020 due to COVID-19. There's roughly a six-month delay in finalization of cases based on the toxicology results, but also because the cases are becoming more complex. Stephanie is going to be sharing some preliminary data from uh, 2020 in a bit. But to use 2019 as an example, in 2019, there were 20 overdose deaths in Winnebago County. Fentanyl remains to be the lead substance in these cases, as well as heroin and methamphetamine. We hear from many of our partners that methamphetamines are on the rise, but we don't necessarily see it in people having fatal overdoses from it. We see those deaths 
deaths in different ways. Next slide, please. What we've learned is that overdoses occur in people of all ages, sexes, and races. In 2019, there were more men than women, obviously a big gap there, but they're mostly in the 22 to 56 year age range. And the majority of deaths occurred among white individuals, although overdoses affect people of all races and ethnicities. Next slide, please. We also wanna share what overdoses look like at the state level so you can see the comparison between local and statewide data. Next slide, please. So since 2014, overdose fatalities have been increasing in the state of Wisconsin, much like our county. This graph is from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, which shows that there were 851 overdose deaths in 2014, and now we're up to 1,189 deaths in 2019. In terms of what kind of drugs, there's been a slight increase in cocaine and meth, a larger increase of multi-drug and opioid deaths, and use of heroin has remained pretty steady over these few years. Most deaths recorded were multi-drug, which means more than one substance shows up in the toxicology report and cause of death for the individual. Most of the cases that we review are also, also multi-drug toxicity, meaning more than one drug. Next slide, please. This graph shows the rate of drug deaths by state and county from 2014 to 2019. So on the graph, graph it shows the state, but for Winnebago County, our rates are 11.0 per 100,000 people for opioids, 4.5 for heroin, 1.5 for cocaine, and meth is the only higher rate that we have compared to the state rate, which is 2.8. As a note, people are also overdosing on other things such as alcohol, over-the-counter medicines like lopiramide or better known as Imodium, cough syrup, aspirin, as well as other prescription medications that are not opioids and not tracked by this data system. Next slide, please. In terms of sex, based on this data, we see that more men are affected by overdose fatalities over women, even though men make up slightly less of the state population. It also breaks it up by substance with heroin leading in the state again. Next slide, please. In terms of age, much like we showed for our county over the years, the highest rate of drug deaths from 2014 to 2019 occurred between the ages of 18 and 44 and 45 and 64, much like our local data. Stephanie is now gonna go through the impact of this data on Winnebago County. So I first want to point out that a lot of what was just shared lives in an annual annual report that just came out from our OFR. So council members, you have this in your hands, but if people are out there and they're listening to this and they want to see this, it's on the Winnebago County Health Department's website. So if you Google Winnebago County OFR or overdose fatality review, you'll get to that page and then there'll be a link to this report where you can review it later. You can also share it with others. So we're really trying to get this report out for community partners and other people that are impacted by substance use so that we can get the word out. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what Jennifer had shared was a lot of overdose deaths. So I want to take a pause here and say overdose death is a real number that we can actually focus on and measure. Overdoses also occur, but sometimes they aren't reported um, or Narcan is used and EMS is not called. So there's a lot more going on in our community than just overdose deaths. So while we're trying to pre prevent overdose deaths, we also want to prevent overdoses. We're also working to reduce and prevent substance use overall. All of these conditions have gone up due to COVID. Next slide, please. So one of the pieces that uh, people in the area of substance use and mental health have been really trying to get in front of our community leaders is this idea of deaths of despair. So deaths of despair is not new, but it does indicate the trends that we're seeing with suicide attempts, suicide and substance use increasing over the last decade. COVID has exasperated all of this. So we'll take a look now at what that looks like for our own community. But if you want to learn more about deaths of despair, that's another thing that you can look into to understand the interconnected dynamic between mental health and substance use. Next slide, please. So this is, we just got this data, uh, I believe it's this past Friday. So uh, you saw the data about 20 overdose deaths in Winnebago County for the year of 2019. This is preliminary deaths that we have confirmed with the uh, Coroner's office. We are uh, we have 29 confirmed overdose deaths through the beginning of October alone. We have eight suspected overdose deaths through between October and the beginning of November. It is likely that we are going to see a doubling of overdose deaths in our county by the end of the year. The end of the year, the second half of the year, is when we see the increase in overdoses and overdose deaths on any year, yet alone COVID. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
So what is the difference that COVID brings? COVID really offers a huge change in the community conditions and the living conditions that people are surrounded in. This list was compiled by our community partners uh, in the overdose fatality review to highlight what was going on, what have you seen between law enforcement, medical um, treatments and recovery services. Uh, and what we saw is, maybe none of this is new, but loss of jobs and income, delays to unemployment, uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, children uh, needing to be cared for in the home, school, and everything of that sort. So these life stressors are contributing to the overdoses and overdose deaths in our community. Next slide, please. So community partners have really worked pretty diligently to address the gaps and issues. Anything from uh, uh, virtual treatment and virtual recovery support to uh, finding other ways to connect people to some of these services. We've also done an amazing job at food uh, insecurity issues in our community. So there's been a lot of time to ensure people have access to food. Housing some of these other challenges are really substantial and there's major gaps in the services even still. COVID has prolonged a lot longer than we had anticipated. So these challenges and these gaps are just continuing to exist. Next slide, please. And this is, so this is where, yep. <laughs> so this is where I get to tell you the great work that we're doing and what we're focusing on. Based on the data reviewed and the themes that come up from our OFRs and the recommendations that are voted on by the OFR team, we've decided that the four that are listed on this slide are our priorities. Mental health, child trauma, recovery support, and uh, our communication across the agencies. And you can see more information in the annual report as well. Next slide, please. But here's where you're asking, what can we do with this huge increase? Well, we all have to do our part, and it starts with realizing that overdose deaths are preventable, just like all of our OFR team members realize. We need to stop writing people off. This is affecting our family, our friends, our coworkers, our children, employees, neighbors. It's going to take an entire community to change the trajectory that we're on. With almost 40 deaths that we're expecting, if not more, it's, it's got to stop. We have made some improvements, but with COVID-19, as Stephanie has said, it has become even more important, even more urgent that we do something with the increase in deaths we're seeing. In the past, Winnebago, has been, uh, Winnebago County has been seen as a leader in community initiatives. And tonight, this presents an opportunity for the council to continue that trend. We have three recommendations that you could take on. The first is creating policies around our changes and conditions that Stephanie had talked about at the beginning of this presentation. Help with the loss of jobs and income, delays in unemployment assistance, food insecurity, eviction or losses of homes, child care services, or simply the isolation that so many of our community members are feeling. Second, as part of our OF recommendations that are listed in the annual report, you could offer a training to all city employees on peer support, mental health, and substitute. This is something that is seen as a major priority from our OFR team and has been done by other communities. Recently, the city of Menasha trained employees across all the city departments, as well as members of Gold Cross Ambulance Service and Nina Manasha Fire Rescue, on recognizing substance use, understanding addiction, and recovery. This training serves as a basis to identify those that are in need in our community that are struggling with addiction and connect them with peer support services. This was part of the Manasha Community um, Addiction Assistance Program, or MCAT, and PRISM Unity Recovery Services. The training already exists and replicated very easily for our city employees and community so that we know how to help this population. Third, our OFR team also recognizes that we have to create a new culture in our community. We need to support and expand a substance-free culture. Sounds really easy, right? It supports individuals and families who are on a path to recovery and also preventing substance use. Work with those that have lived experience to better understand that we can change. This not only affects those struggling with addiction, those that have made it successful into recovery, but young families, like my own, that are trying to raise kids in a safe and healthy community with opportunities for all. Lead that change in culture. Next slide, please. Lastly, and this is something that I tell all my OFR partners, we have to take care of yourself and others, especially during this challenging time and with the holidays coming up. We know that there are going to be increase in overdoses, an increase in suicides, and an increase in social isolation. Our OFR team made this recommendation, and you've probably seen it in the Oshkosh Herald, as well as uh, with some of our partners handing it out. But our local UW Oshkosh, Captain Tarman, had created it, and it's now being distributed to 10 other counties. Our message is simple. We care about you. We want you to get the help you need when you are ready. 
We want you to check on one another and that connection to care. So Stephanie, the other OFR partners and myself would be more than happy to continue updating the council on our progress or updated numbers as we have them. We're here to help with anything that you need to help create the necessary change in our community. And that's it. Well, thank you, uh, Stephanie and Jennifer. Um, I don't know if other council members have any questions, but we certainly appreciate um, also including recommendations. And uh, I just wanted to, I think, emphasize that we appreciate the uh, reminder that we need to support recovery and uh, alternative events. Are there other council members who have questions for the presenters? Council member Ford. Yes. Um, thank you very much for, for presenting. Very interesting stuff. Um, you mentioned Menasha. Could you um, share with us? You don't have, obviously you can't do it right now, but can you update us or follow up with us with uh, specifics of what Menasha did for training and anything else that you've seen other cities do that perhaps we could we could emulate? That would be really helpful. Uh, I think at least from my perspective, for us to take a policy path forward. We'd be glad to. All right. Other council member questions. Again, thank you so much for for bringing this very important information to us um, at this level of detail and with data. And uh, thank you again. I'm sure there will be follow up uh, exchanges. Thank you for the opportunity. Good evening. All right, then. Uh, next, we have. Uh, citizen statements to council. Um, I have one email that came, uh, we have in our orange folder, virtual orange folder, one email, but I wanted to just check in with the clerk to see if there were others. I have uh, an email regarding 20-47 from Dr. Tony Palmieri. Are there others, um, Pam? I have no citizen statements, but I do have citizens that want to speak to agenda items. Okay, uh, why don't we start there then? Okay, for item number 24, Shirley Brava, Brabender Maddox, 1313 Jackson Street. Yes, welcome, Shirley. Thank you, Mayor. And hello, city councilors. Um, I thought I was going to speak when you were going to discuss this, but since it's at the beginning, that is just fine. Um, I'm speaking about the North Jackson plan from Murdoch to Highway 45. And I would like to commend the city, um, commend um, Alan Davis, who back, um, back in two, 2018 thought, you know, if we're going to do a historic Jackson neighborhood. Maybe we could get a plan that goes all the way Jackson um, up to the highway also. Um, and years ago, I can remember saying to Darren Burrich, you know, we need a plan for Jackson. There's so much potential. And yet, if we just plop something here and plop something there, you don't have a plan. And what's the vision? But um, there's so much, so many possibilities for growth. Um, we can't go east because we have our beautiful lake, but we do have the potential for going north. So I want to commend um, Alan Davis and the City Council for approving the um, Ayers Associates and um, RDG to develop a plan um, to spend it in the budget, and then tonight to hopefully look at this and approve it. Um, there's wonderful connectivity that they, these consultants have seen and um, potential for commercial, residential, neighborhoods. Um, I just think it's a very thoughtful plan and I, I would like to um, recommend that you accept this and it will affect all the neighborhoods also in this area. And it's gonna be a wonderful gateway um, from the north into the city. So thank you. Thank you. Who's next, Pam? 
Uh, Shirley would also like to speak to item number 25. Oh, okay, very good. Okay. Um, so item 25 is about the um, plan for the Jackson Street, the historic Jackson neighborhood. Um, it's a safety plan, quality of life study. And um, once again, these fantastic consultants um, who've been doing this for years, I mean, they have wonderful reputations, um, looked at the important things, and it was the people that use, use this um, highway, that use this roadway, um, and use the neighborhood. Um, the people that walk, that bike, and that drive. And it's not just up and down Jackson, it's 17 intersecting streets in that one mile. Um, you start down at Church and you have Union and Amherst and um, Irving and Lincoln and Prospect and Scott. And I mean, the streets go on and on and it's all within one mile and that's our neighborhood. So everybody that travels up and down or that crosses Jackson interacts and it has become um, very unsafe since a four lane highway was um, constructed. And at the time, um, the Federal Highway Administration was realizing that four lane undivided uh, streets were not safe. But since that had already been planned, it went through. And um, I can remember when I was on the council, we used to get an annual report on the safety um, report from the uh, traffic um, transportation director. And one night um, um, they were talking, the New York Avenue came up and, you know, the number of crashes and Bill Castle said, oh, I was just there today. I was two cars behind another crash. And it was almost like, well, I guess that's life. And um, it's not life. It's, um, it's, to be, one of the responsibilities for a city is for, for um, to provide safety. The police have done everything possible to make this a safe street. Um, and just a police of, um, presence does not change the speed patterns or habits. Once the police is gone, it's like once the teacher turns her back, the spitballs continue. And um, so that hasn't worked. So the plan that the um, consultants have presented with feedback signs, with restriping and putting in a center lane for a left, left turn lane um, will also accommodate the 148 driveways in which people turn left into so that we don't have people um, smashing into you from the back or when you're at going, turning left onto a street, you have a, uh, a T-bone crash. Um, so I think the consultants have included everything in this package to make this a safe neighborhood. Um, it accommodates people that walk, bike, people on their motorized wheelchairs, um, drivers, and hopefully we can once again say that Jackson Street is a safe neighborhood and people will feel safe walking, biking, and driving on it. So I asked the city council to recommend um, or to follow the recommendations of the council and to um, incorporate this into one plan and one package. And um, if you need help with financing, maybe we can figure out some way to do that too. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And who do we have next, Pam? I have no further citizens registered. All right, then. Uh, we did receive an email from Dr. Tony Palmieri, strongly supporting on 20-47 uh, the option 2A and asking that we do that on behalf of the Middle Village Neighborhood Association um, as it's the greatest uh, safety improvement 
provides a greater separation for pedestrians, uh, cyclists, and vehicular traffic, as well as uh, being a proven safety opportunity along with those users and quality of life um, and a positive impact on Middle Village. So that is all we have for public comment on agenda items. We'll move on to consent agenda. Need a motion and a second. All right, Deputy Mayor Krause and Council Member Ford. Discussion on consent agenda items. Um, doesn't look like we have anyone to speak on that, so we'll go ahead and take the roll on consent. Alice Nazi. Aye. Krause. Aye. Hoover Hour? Erickson? Ford? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Carrie Smith? All right. Very good. We'll go on to pending ordinance 20 482 for cancellation of the December 22nd council meeting. We'll need a motion and a second on that. Second. All right, please call the roll. Allison Osby? Aye. Uber Hour? Erickson? Aye. Ford? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Carrie, six. All right, next we have a new ordinance. Uh, there will be no action tonight on this item. Ordinance-20-483 uh, approves zone change from central mixed-use district with a planned development overlay to central mixed-use district at 500-502 North Main Street. Um, is Mr. Lyons or Mr. Davis here to just kind of give a brief summary of what that change involves or? Yes. Mr. I know Mr. Davis is here. It takes me a while to turn all the buttons on when you can't find the cursor sometimes. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, let's see, this is a at the corner of um, Merritt and North Main Street. You recall the market had a Boys and Girls Club off-premise sign up, and that was the purpose of TD. And Planning Commission and Council directed staff that when their temporary use was done, that we would rezone it back without any cost to the, to the owner. And that's what we're doing. All right, thank you. And again, there's no action on that item, so we will move on to uh, new resolutions. 20-484, approve general development plan and specific implementation plan for a commercial development at 1870 Oshkosh Avenue. Plan Commission recommends approval. We have a motion and a second. Councilmember Erickson and House Mayor Ford. Discussion? Again, Mr. Davis, uh, do you want to share a little bit about 1870 Oshkosh Ave? Sure. This is on the north side of Oshkosh Ave, northwest corner. Uh, there at Keller. It used to be the Master Lube site. If people are familiar with that, uh, Fox Communities Credit Union will be uh, building a new building uh, there at the corner, and it will have a drive through. There will not be any access to Oshkosh Ave or Keller. All their access will come off of RAF. Uh, and, it meets, uh, and exceeds a lot of our architectural requirements. There's a lot of base standard modifications because it's a three frontage lot. So that makes it difficult to meet all the high standards we put on that corporate business park. And they've compensated by providing a lot more landscaping and uh, 
building uh, elevations uh, to compensate for that. All right, very good. Any other discussion on this item? All right, please take the roll. Allison Asi. Aye. Mugerauer. Rickson. Perfect. Ford. Crosby. Deputy Mayor, you might be muted. Oh, I think we've got a little connection issue there. And Jake, you may want to stop your video and you'll probably be able to participate uh, without a problem. Crosby. Aye. Oh, there he is. Okay. Paul Mary. Aye. Mary six. All right, next resolution 20 480. I'm sorry. Yes, 485. Approved general development plan and specific implementation plan for a multi family development located at Logan Drive, west of Jackson Street. Again, plan and commission recommends approval. A motion and a second, please. Sure. Council members Ford and Mugerauer. Yep. All right, any discussion on 485? Seeing none, please take the roll. Allison Asti. Rosie. Mugerauer. Erickson. Aye. Ford. O'Leary. Aye. Jerry Six. All right, next we're at uh, 486, Approve and Vision North Jackson Plan. Plan Commission recommends approval. A motion and a second, please. Council members Erickson and Allison Osby, I believe. Discussion? Any discussion on approving the Envision North Oshkosh Jackson plan? All right, please take the roll. Allison Osby? Aye. Crosby? Mulgrower? Erickson? Aye. Ford? Aye. Palmieri? Aye. Carried six. And next we have 20-487. We did have uh, someone speak earlier and an email on that item. I'll need a motion and a second for approving implementation plan for Jackson Street Multimodal Traffic Study, Safety and Quality of Life Study. So. Second, anybody? Second. Councilmember Ford and Erickson, thank you. Discussion. Councilmember Allison Asby. Um, I had a question and my apologies for not reaching out to um, James Robbie ahead of time. It's been an incredibly busy uh, couple of days, but one of the questions I had for the recommendation that they have is how would that impact the residential properties um, in regards to recycling and also garbage pickup. Because right now- The implementation of the striping? Well, like right now there's four lanes. And so as the, the trucks go through to pick up, typically the traffic coming will go around it in the other lane on both sides. So, you know, will that negatively at all impact um, uh, refuse and um, recycling. Impact our ability to collect refuse and recycling. It certainly uh, is likely to create some traffic uh, back up behind the trucks at that time when they're coming down Jackson. Um, you know, I, I'm sure some people will try to use the the two way left turn to get around, but um, you know that's not what it's there for. It's there just for the left turning vehicles. So. You know, at the time the garbage and recycling trucks are moving up and down Jackson, you will probably experience some additional traffic delays 
during that short period of time. Great question. Other council discussion on 487. Council Member Ford. A question, we need to specify an option here, correct, as a council? I was just gonna mention that Council Member Ford, Mr. Davis brought that to my attention as well. Well, then I, correct. I, I would love to do so. Then I think 2A makes um, the most sense. Um, I think that is the safest. Um, it seems to be from all of our communication, uh, what residents want, nobody communicated at least to me um, against it. Uh, it's also what the consultants recommend and I think it's a good improvement. Council discussion. Um, Mr. Davis, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Allison Asby. Actually, Madam Mayor, go ahead and ask that question because I just wanted to double check on a number of participants. Okay. Um, Mr. Davis, yes. just wondering if, I'm sorry, Mr. Rolla? Yeah, Madam Mayor, I guess I just consult with the city attorney. She drafted the resolution. Mr. Ford indicated he wanted to support 2A. Do we need a motion for 2A to have that introduced? Um, so, Madam Mayor, I would suggest that you, uh, I assume that was a motion, or Council Member Ford will agree to that, and then get a second to put, have 2A as the option on the table for Council to consider before you do the final vote on the full resolution. Uh, Ms. Lawrence, is that correct? Um, in the resolution, we had just had a parenthesis that council needed to specify the selected alternate, so. So, Council Member Ford, you're, are you offering a motion to support 2A? Yes. All right, do we have a second? That was the second, all right then. I would suggest now you talk about, you, you just discussed the context. It's just that now you have the motion on the floor. You'll have to take two votes, but that's really all you need to do. All right, very good. So further discussion, uh, Council Member Allison Asby, I believe you had another question. Well, regarding this plan, and I thought I had read either in the contents that we had received or maybe it was in uh, previous contents of actual, you know, participation from the residents, because there are those that actually are owner occupied, and then there are a number of those that are rent are rental properties as well. So, you know, a couple things. Um, I do travel down Jackson Street quite a bit at various times throughout the day. Um, I do agree there is definitely a safety issue. There is definitely it can be a a speed zone, and um, you know, but. There, there is a concern that comes with it. And for all of the things that Shirley uh, Brabender Maddox, if I, said, if I didn't say that right, Shirley, I have my apologies. But there isn't one thing that I disagree with that Shirley said. What my concern is, is, is it is a truck route. And my concern is, um, and when I travel at various points of time of day, I see, you know, large uh, vehicles, rather they're court vehicles, um, uh, you know, private um, contractor like dump trucks, uh, semi trucks, a number of things. And so, one of the things with having the four lanes is, is there is, there is visible, you know, there is vis visibility. And if people aren't paying attention when they stop, you know, there is kind of that ability where people I've seen kind of go into the different lanes. And so, what my question is, is that there's a significant amount of traffic. And I think, you know, there's something to be said that with narrowing it, is that gonna push a lot of the traffic and even the bigger vehicle traffic somewhere else? But then are we creating a better safety issue here, but then we're pushing it somewhere else? Are we pushing it down Main Street? Are we pushing it on Algoma? And so those are some of the things that I'm concerned about, but, but I completely understand why there would be support for a 2A. The other, the other question that I have is, and it is a little bit different scenario because the road diet on Murdoch, I'm on the end that, that does have it. And it is very difficult to come in and out. The good news with that is that the majority of it is commercial versus say, you know, residential. But you know, how will this impact in the different times of day? And if there is a backup, 
will that you know impact where then residents are going to have difficulty getting in and out of their their driveways um you know and then of course in depending i think it's uh i had reached out to allison garner and and she had thought the addition onto merrill school um which is you know two to four years down the road is is a pro um for you know potentially additional students you know that we would have more safety standards but on the flip side too does that also create more traffic and so for this one i'm struggling because there's so many reasons to support it and then there's so many things that i don't know that we can predict that would lead me to be hesitant to support it so if staff has any I guess insight as to some of the concerns I have, I would greatly appreciate it. This is off, and maybe Mr. Collins could chime in uh, regarding the truck traffic. Uh, we asked the consultants to uh, put together the level of service that they are projecting with 2A, and for the most part, the traffic at the same level of service that we exist that exists today. So I don't think there's going to be a, a change that's going to push much traffic anywhere. We're thinking it would be some going to Main Street or Algoma like you suggested, but the model just doesn't show us that much as that happens. The other thing regarding the backing or the traffic trying to get into the driveways of the residential properties. It's kind of counterintuitive to me in that the consultants explain that when you have that center turn lane, uh, people learn to use that for their maneuvering out of the residential uh, properties. And maybe Colin can explain that better because I'm not a traffic person when it comes to that. But they said that it should actually improve the situation that they have right now. Uh, and then I think the last item that I'd talk about timing is that in uh, 2022, we're going to be reconstructing Algoma. Uh, once that's done, then we have a better sense of what this impact is going to be on the transportation system, and then we'll be able to make any changes that we might need. And the nice thing about the restriping is that if we discover in three or four years, we can restripe it back to what it is today. Uh, and because we're not pouring any concrete or we're not doing anything significant in the in the street. So if it turns out this doesn't work or it creates bad impacts, we could reverse it. Did I did I hit the, the highlights of what we've heard so far? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, like you said, the truck traffic, we don't know for sure. I mean it's possible that some of it'll go um down Main Street or Algoma. So um I the models though showed a pretty minimal impact on level service and basically level of services means that you know that's how how much you're delayed and how free traffic is flowing you know with a is a free flowing and f is gridlock um, and they showed that with or without the road reconfiguration or road diet that traffic would still function at an acceptable level and there'd be very minimal impact um, i do think that um, there is a trade-off, you know, there's a trade-off a little bit between traffic flow and traffic calming. Um, obviously, the neighborhoods are, the neighbors are interested in traffic calming, um, and when the DFT reconstructed the road, they were interested in traffic flow. Um, so, the two things, there is a little bit of a trade-off. I mean, both of them obviously can exist, but um, that's kind of where we're at. There's a little bit of a trade-off between the two. Um, but as far as getting in and out of the driveways, um, Basically, you can use that center left turn lane as uh, refuge. So if you need to get in your driveway, you can kind of wait that if you're turning left in your driveway, that is, which would be the more of the concern, you could get into that center left turn lane and you'd only be crossing one lane of traffic versus two. Um, and then if you were trying to get out of your driveway and see turning right won't be as big of an issue as turning left, but if you're turning left out of your driveway, you also could get into that shared left turn lane and use that as a merge lane um, to then get into traffic. So, yeah, I would, Madam Mayor, if I might, uh, to add to that, uh, I'm going to uh, put Councilmember Rugrauer on the spot a little bit because he had asked Mr. Collins a question today, and I think you were kind of trying to get to that 
Council Member Mugrauer, in terms of the volume, because Ninth Avenue, we we did the same thing, and that is a residential street as well. Um, and my observations have been that people have used it as a refuge, and I did ask that question during the workshop because I was concerned about uh, the number of people that live on Jackson that would will need to get out. Getting in, actually, I, I, I would argue that this would be an improvement. Getting out, I was concerned it would be a challenge, and that's where uh, I think Alan mentioned that, uh, and, and both Alan and Jim mentioned that there's a bit of a refuge. But Mr. Mugrauer, you were asking for the data to uh, compare the traffic volume on 9th versus um, Jackson, and I know that Jim provided you that information. So either Jim or Matt, I don't know how you, you can just chime in. I thought that was good information. I'm I'm happy to share it. Um, you're right. I did ask that question in terms of because Ninth was so relevant and so recent. Um, it is one of the major thoroughfares through the community. Obviously, going all the way from you know far west side all the way to downtown Maine. Um, and it looked like from uh, from Rikau to Nap is what uh, Mr. Collins provided. You know, traffic counts average daily uh, right about 12,500, which is pretty similar to right around the New York um, Jackson Street interchange area. So it's very similar in terms of, of traffic counts. So, uh, as you get a little bit more north of New York, it gets a little heavier in there, um, but it's very similar. Um, so that was one of my concerns because, as, as City Manager Roloff pointed out, um, you know, what does it do within that neighborhood? I know several property owners in the Ninth Street area that had it done right in front of their houses. They're thankful for it. Um, it's helped them a lot in terms of being able to navigate their own streets they live on. Um, I've got concerns too, and, and I'll voice those in a little bit, but uh, uh, City Manager Roloff giving me the chance to add that info. Thank you for those comments. Uh, um, Mr. Davis, I, I had asked you earlier um, about the uh, discussions regarding the Merrill School uh, draft plans for addressing that, and I, I think you were able to obtain a, an image to share with Council of what their tentative plan is in terms of routing for pickup drop-offs. Yes, I'm hoping uh, media services could display that because I can't, or at least I don't. Tony, are you able to uh, share that? What attachment is that? I'm afraid it went to Jake Tim, so let me. Is it that, is it that picture? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just a minute, I'll share that up. So there were a couple of folks who had emailed or called that had concerns about um, whether the timing uh, would allow for readdressing or revisiting, I should say, uh, with regard to, but it looks like their tentative plans, this would not, according to the consultants, uh, be an issue. Is that accurate? That was my understanding when we were able to, uh, the school district could share this concept plan with us that we shared with the consultant. And based on the drop-offs, pickups, and uh, the traffic for parents and staff, they didn't see there would be a, a an Jackson Street that would uh, take the recommendation. Do you recall if there was anything specific that uh, needed to accommodate based on the new middle school site plan concept on Jackson? When we will ask the school district to do a traffic impact analysis um, in conjunction with their building plans, but the consultants were, we did share this uh, layout with them. Um, and obviously the, you know, the drop off and pickup area, if I remember, you know, you can see there's more on Nevada and Kentucky. Um, so they didn't think it would have a major impact on Jackson Street. But, uh, like I said, in conjunction with that, we will require them to do a traffic impact analysis, which then will tell us um, if there are any projected issues that we need to address in, in, when it comes time. Yeah, I I talked to staff about this as well, and you know, and, and Jim already mentioned we're going to do we're going to require a traffic impact analysis as we do would do for any 
land developer that would be doing this thing. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that staff is not recommending that we put the bump outs in immediately. Just want to take a look at what's going to happen out there. Uh, and as the school district's plans uh, evolve, then we can take a look and see if there's any impacts we need to do. Um, you know, even though the concept shows an access point for, I believe, deliveries, yeah, I'm very concerned about uh, any access points on the Jackson Street. Um, and we're going to have to take a, a close, hard look at those access points because uh, we don't want to uh, exacerbate a problem out there. So mm -hmm. those are things that we're all going to look at. Uh, I don't have a date for you to get together with the school board yet, but when you do, I know that the council will be bringing this up, wanting to make sure that we're engaged with them. And as you can see with Mr. Collins and Mr. Davis, they've already uh, gotten the word out that we want to be actively involved uh, in how this is uh, developed because this will have an impact on the neighborhood for uh, literally generations. Absolutely. All right, so uh, on the floor currently is uh, the motion for 2A. Is there any further discussion on 2A before we call the roll? Council Member Mugerauer. Um, I appreciate Council Member Allison Osby's comments. Actually, many of mine were similar, but uh, I want to ask at least Mr. Collins one or two quick follow-ups. Um, when we did the Night Street uh, redesign you know, the layout. Um, were there any traffic counts that were completed afterwards to compare, you know, pre and post um, restriping? Just in terms of to confirm, you know, did did traffic move somewhere else? Um, so I'm wondering, I'm wondering about that. Yeah, I haven't um, looked at that specifically, but I know from. Um, the traffic counts that were just done or just looked at with this project versus um, when we restart that a couple of years ago, they're really close. So I would say that there really hasn't been a change. Okay, um, so, okay I appreciate that. Cause that was one of my concerns was pushing traffic. I don't mind pushing it to Main Street. Main Street was built for that. My, my concern would be pushing it to Wisconsin Street, which between New York and um, is it Congress or New York and Bent, is a very poor one lane road each way. Very, very poor. One of the worst roads in town, actually, in, under, in my estimation. Um, so that would be a concern pushing traffic to that um, ill equipped segment of town um, for any residential or, or commercial traffic. So, and then uh, additionally, if we, um, if we did this, obviously we're gonna lose a few state dollars and it, in the grand scheme, it's not a whole lot, but it's still, you know, 8,000 bucks. Is there anything else we lose or any other things that things that we stand to not get from the state or in terms of just uh, um, any state designations or anything like that that we lose because of changing this layout from what, what they gave us? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. And I don't know, James, if, you, if you're aware of anything, but all that we are aware of is the, um, it's so Jackson Street's connecting highway um, 45. So we do, that's based on lane miles. So, we did look at that and it looks like we were going to lose about, um, like you mentioned, about $8,000 a year in that um, connecting highway aid, but I'm not aware of anything else. And James, are you? Our calculation for general transportation aids does not use lean miles. It uses our, our total expenses, so it would not affect that. It only affects those connecting highway aids that you mentioned. Thank you. Council Member Allison Asby. So, you know, um, I just wanted to address, so Mr. Mugerauer, like I agree with you that there are definitely sections of Main Street that I think, you know, I'm not worried about it going to, but when you look at and going back to studies and it is a little bit different after the oranges, but it, when Main Street was done, especially in the business district, I mean, it, it turned out great, but it also, there's a number of issues regarding trite traffic because of how far out, um, you know, the sidewalks are, which obviously adds to the quality of life, but it also has added some safety issues and concerns um, 
regarding business owners and those that are active in the downtown area or park actively down there. So that's, you know, my kind of my concern to shove those, you know, would the vehicles go down there? And then, of course, you know, there is Wisconsin Street as well. And I think the other thing with it, and again, there's just as there's just as many reasons to do it as in my mind in some ways not to do it my other probably one of my biggest concerns is that i am incredibly shocked and surprised that we haven't had more public comment on such an important route and so my question is in regards to timing is it seems as if ever since we went virtual and all virtual we have had less and less and less community participation um, we virtually at times have had nobody participate not even when you know we were doing kind of the, the study so how many people actually are really truly aware that we're doing this on a major, major thoroughfare and is the timing correct or is this something more to visit when we're kind of a little bit more back to normal and and, and maybe it's just coincidence but my my experience has just been that We've had, we've had some significant issues come up and just not a lot of feedback from the community. And, it, and what I wonder, is it this COVID and virtual environment? And has, you know, is that a concern for any other council member? Well, um, thank you, Council Member Allison Asby. I, I beg to differ. I believe that there have been uh, numerous public participation opportunities. I, I personally sat in on uh, one of the workshops. There's been quite a bit of email and phone calls and uh, input on this matter over the last several months, and it's been worked on for a year. Um, and we've had, I, I believe, at least in my email inbox, uh, significantly more public input and then uh, folks, you know, making contact and being more aware. But I, I respect the fact that you know, you have those concerns. Do other council members have concerns that there's not been enough time or input? And just to clarify, I'm not saying enough time. I'm just more concerned about the community input. And I haven't seen the phone calls or emails that you may have, Madam Chair. Oh, okay, sure. Council Member Mugerauer. It was a, a concern of mine as well uh, in terms of just involvement and making sure that it's not just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it real blunt, it's not just the neighborhood association that's pushing this or receiving this, that um, everyone has a fair shake in terms of just um, participating in the process. Um, I appreciate all the neighborhood associations we, we have and what they do, I've stated that on numerous occasions, I love the work because they, they, uh, they stick up for their small segments of the community and try to reflect uh, you know, reflect good things upon the larger community. Um, you know, I wonder about the downtown bid and, and things like that. Um, in, in terms of timing, there's nothing that says we have to approve this tonight. I don't think it'll change the outcome much if we if we did delay it. I think I think we all know where it's going to go. Um, but it may be appropriate to put um, to lay it over to January's first meeting uh, to elicit a little bit more response. Nothing's going to get completed until June anyways in terms of striping. Nobody's going to be putting paint down for six or seven months until it gets warm out. So um, just my thoughts. It'd be interesting to hear what other council members have to say as well. Well, and I'd just like to say that this was more than one neighborhood association that weighed in on this. There were actually four uh, that I heard from. Uh, of course, uh, those that were most directed were uh, Jackson Street, historic Jackson Street, but we heard from the Midtown Neighborhood Association members, or at least I did via email, uh, and as was noted earlier, Middle Village, and I believe uh, someone from Menominee South, or it could have been uh, Menominee North, I, I don't recall, but uh, I think that we, I'll be supporting 2A, uh, we have said to the community that we're building strong neighborhoods and this supports strong neighborhoods, this supports public health, safety, and welfare for all users of that roadway um, in addition to vehicular traffic, um, cyclists, pedestrians. It's also, uh, as many people know, 
a through way for university and uh, so I'll be supporting two way and supporting strong neighborhoods in that regard. Council member Erickson and then uh, Deputy Mayor Krause. I just wanted to add that I did attend, I think all three public input sessions on this plan. Um, and I was really impressed by the turnout for all of them. I think the last session was went virtual and still I thought had a decent turnout. I don't know, you know, the percentage of attendees who are from neighborhood associations, but um, I would say as a new council member, I'm, I'm impressed at kind of the process that this plan went through and um, how much input there was kind of before this, this meeting. So. Deputy Mayor Crosby. Um, I think this has been a, a hazard for years on Jackson. I think the neighborhoods have talked about that it's, four lane speed trap, speed track, and obviously reducing it down to one lane each way at the center turn lane would slow traffic. If it'd be a little busier, busy is okay. If the road's safer for people crossing the street, people driving, people backing out of their driveways. Um, a resident said that it may be back, easier to back out of the driveway only looking at one lane of traffic coming up instead of two. And sometimes people stop and let people back out of their driveways too. So I think it would be a community effort to make the neighborhood more friendly. So I would support 2A. And like Mr. Mugar said, nothing's going to happen until spring. I know where this is going. So if it gets delayed till January, the outcome is going to be the same. So I'm I'm fine either way. But I'll be supporting 2A. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Ford. For you know that I'm 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 supporting it, but just objectively, I mean. That that section of action is a problem. It's a safety problem. I believe it's a safety problem. I would have said that. Well, I did say that prior to ever being on uh, town and council. Um, now, everybody I've heard from in the neighborhood, and yes, many yeah. of the associations um, have, have spoken in favor of it. The consultant recommended 2A. Um, if, if I would have had the consultant say that we do something else, um, perhaps I'd, I'd want to pause and wait till January, but I think the process has been a long process. I think it's played out. If the, the bid or anybody else had significant concerns, I think they had ample time, uh, ample time to share them. And we do also have a safety net here in that we're not doing the bump out. So we're not actually altering kind of the footprint. So as, as we, I think it was uh, Mr. Collins who said, if this is a disaster or if there's something unexpected that we didn't know about, we do have the ability uh, to to go back on it without major surgery. So I think it's a no-brainer. And I'd also like to thank the um, bike and pedestrian uh, committee as well as the, the traffic committee for their recommendations. Uh, those uh, were recommending option 2A as well. Do we have other council members that want to discuss any further 2A before we vote? All right, please take the roll on 2A. Allison Lassie. Thank you. Crowley. Uh, I'm Four. I'm Mary. Mary six. All right. So then we need to bring back the full resolution, correct? Correct. As amended. As amended, supporting option two A. I'll need a motion and second. Correct? No, it's, we just need a vote. As amended, please take the roll. Allison Asti. Aye. Move it over. Erickson. Aye. Aye. Four. Oh, Mary? Aye. Mary, six. Thank you. And moving on to resolution 
20-488, approve conditional use permit to make a legal use under the previous ordinance a legal conforming use at 3849 to 3851 and 3850 and 3852 Parkview Court. Planning Commission recommends approval. We'll take a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Third and Deputy Mayor Crosby. And any discussion on 488? Seeing none, please call the roll. Allison Asti. Crosby. Aye. Hoover Orr. Aye. Erickson. Ford. Aye. Almary. Aye. Carrie Six. All right, next is uh, Resolution 20-489, approve agreement with Greater Oshkosh Economic Development Corporation for Economic Development Services, 105,000. Take a motion on that. Councilmember Mugrauer and Erickson. All right, discussion on 489. And uh, is Mr. White here also? I don't believe he is, but Mr. Davis uh, okay. negotiated this agreement with him. Okay. Uh, discussion on 489. All right. Council Member Mugerauer. Um, no, just brief comments. Um, uh, Go ADC and under Jason White's uh, direction has done great things for the, this community. Um, fully supportive of that continued relationship and um, thankful for their help in, in getting out those um, those loan dollars during the, the COVID pandemic that we've been going under, um, moving fast and trying to uh, do all they can to help businesses in this community. So appreciate the efforts on their part and, and glad that we get, uh, get to keep partnering with them for a, a few more years. Okay. Council member Allison Asby, did you have something? With uh, Mr. Mugerauer, I'm very appreciative, and um, I have to say my experience with uh, Greater Oshkosh Economic Development Corp with Jason White and the staff that, that he has had, certainly whenever there's been inquiries in the community, whether it's uh, folks from outside or, or within, uh, that Jason and his staff have always been very uh, prompt um, in reaching out to them and also encouraging them, and if they can't help them, has certainly directed them in a um, in a manner that would hopefully help. So always appreciate their effort and uh, this is always a worthwhile um, spending of our dollars. Thank you. And uh, I believe I was uh, asking city manager when we were reviewing this the other day, uh, perhaps Mr. Davis, you can speak to this. In that agreement with uh, Go EDC, do we have specific uh, requests in there for supporting uh, the minority and women-owned business creation entrepreneurship uh, that was spoken of, I believe, at a presentation last year that, that was asked about. I would say the agreement specifically says they need to work with us on any of the economic development priorities we would have in the city. I don't think it specifically calls out disadvantaged or minority businesses, but I can tell you they've already used the capital catalyst and other funds that we've had to help minority businesses throughout the community. Uh, and we're exploring different ways to help with uh, more entrepreneurship with min minorities. They've applied for capital catalyst number three. We're hoping we get that funded in the next few months, uh, as well as any other activities that we're looking at for COVID recovery. A lot of those are disadvantaged businesses that are in the hospitality and tourism industry. So uh, they've mm -hmm. spent a lot of time uh, helping existing businesses uh, through their business retention mm -hmm. and their plans for entrepreneurship would include not only minority and disadvantaged, but in other businesses as well. A lot of them happen to be minority and business uh, enterprises. And, and, and I, I would add, based yeah, on the yeah. conversation I had with the mayor that yeah, I've had discussions uh, as a member of the uh, 
executive committee for Go EDC and what we do next with the funds that we set aside for loans for uh, COVID response. Um, the demand has not been uh, overwhelming. It's been good, but not overwhelming. Uh, and there may be some opportunities for us to take a look at some of those funds and repurpose them into loan programs that may be more targeted. Uh, and we could certainly look at uh, minority women disadvantaged uh, business enterprises. Uh, as Alan talks about, we've already done in some of those loans, uh, but maybe repurpose them uh, to draw attention to the fact that we do want to support uh, more uh, minority uh, women business enterprises. And I believe that uh, we, I believe it was a discussion maybe with someone uh, at WEDC about, um, you know, including uh, focus too on veterans, uh, veteran owned businesses as well. And I, I think that they have supported some veteran owned businesses as well. All right. Yeah, yeah. They have. Okay, good. All right, please take the roll on 489. Allison Osby? Aye. Rosie? Mugrower? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Ford? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Carrie okay. Six? All right, next 20-490, approve amendment to transportation agreement with Oshkosh Area School District for student transportation. We'll take a motion and a second, and I do see that Council Member Peschel has joined us. Thank you. Pam, if you could. All right. Uh, looks like we have a motion and a second from Council Member Smookerauer, and I'm sorry I didn't catch the other. All right. <laughs> Discussion. Council Member McGrower. Um, just brief. Um, I appreciate City Manager Roloff and uh, City Attorney Lawrenson working on this with the school district staff and school district office to uh, to get this to us in a timely fashion. Uh, appreciate their willingness to uh, amend the agreement that we have and. Looking forward to adding a third year onto this to, to really fulfill the intent that we all had, um, which was to try to figure out if this is a true need and uh, figure out true costs. So I uh, appreciate all the effort on this one, and, and uh, of course, I'll be supporting it. House Member Pushel, were you raising your hand or just adjusting your camera? All right. Anyone else? All right. Please take the roll. Allison Asi? Rosie? Mugrower? Erickson? Eschel? Ford? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Three, seven. All right, next is 20 491, approve amendment to 2020 capital improvement budget to provide funding for a transportation utility analysis. Take a motion and a second. Councilmember Mugrower, Deputy Mayor Krause, and discussion. Councilmember Mugrower. To uh, probably pivot to City Manager Roloff to start. Um, it's his suggestion we we uh, that we consider this. So, Mark, take it away. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, staff today had a, um, a meeting with uh, several members uh, from the league who the league put together who have been working on these uh, potential transportation utility fee options. So it was, it was a great opportunity. The timing was perfect to have this discussion. Um, council had delayed um, do, moving forward with something like this, waiting to see what uh, Janesville was going to do. And we heard from Janesville. And while they have a report that's been prepared by uh, this, this same group that we're going to, uh, after council approves this, 
we'll uh, we'll sign the agreement. But R. A. Smith, along with Ellers, uh, our financial consultant, have worked together to produce a report for the city of Janesville and numerous other communities um, to work on this. The Janesville Council is not going to take it up till January, but uh, the belief that we've talked about among staff and Mr. Van Gompel and Mr. Robbie are both here to to uh, you know add uh, any commentary that they may have, but. For us to truly be able to talk to our community, particularly our business community that had concerns with the proposal that council turned down last year, um, we need to give them a better idea of what this would look like uh, to give them the ability, you know, even in disagreement, uh, to know exactly what they're disagreeing with. Um, I think city attorney has pointed out on numerous occasions through her analysis, and she repeated it today with the lead group that um, the everything that we've read says that the traffic based fee is the most legally defensible. And that was the issue that we took up with the committee that that had addressed it last year. And uh, for us to do this, what we're suggesting for this action item, uh, we don't have the funding specifically identified for this this council action would give us that funding. I technically have the authority to sign the contract because it's under $75,000, but it still needs council approval for this. And of course, I want to know that, that you know, you're on board with us proceeding this way. I think this is the way to go for us to be able to, to truly look at this. Every community is doing this for a different reason. Janesville already has a, um, a vehicle registration fee slash wheel tax, pick your wording. Um, other communities just want to add it for maintenance. Others are looking to get rid of special assessments like us. Others are trying to avoid going to special assessments like us. Um, several of them attended the league conference back in 2019, at which we sort of did a little autopsy on our experience with this. and. Um, you know, the experience we went through, uh, other communities don't want to go through. And so they're looking at these same types of analyses. And we're getting some efficiencies that I think Mr. Robbie can talk to in terms of because R.A. Smith and Ellers are doing this for several municipalities. But to dig deep into our data, they need to spend a little time. James, can we add, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, James or Russ, if you've got any any additional comments. No, I think one thing that I would like to add, you know, when we were talking about this probably a year and a half ago, we did talk about doing a, a trip generation based analysis. And at that time, you know, I, I recommended not going down that road because I believed it was going to be very time consuming and very costly. Since that time, with everything that we've seen transpire and in communication with the consultants, um, you know, I, I've realize that it's not as time consuming or as costly as I had thought a year and a half ago. Um, and, and that's why I, you know, in, in consultation with the city manager and finance director, we, we think this is the right avenue for us to, to proceed down to be able to provide you, the council, with enough information to ultimately make it a decision. Mr. Agampo? No? Okay. Um, so, just to be clear then, this would only cover the kind of trip generation type modeling. This does not, or does it, also include uh, an analysis regarding potential inclusion of a vehicle registration fee or just that trip generation modeling? This is just the trip generation modeling because that's what R.A. Smith would be doing. Okay. Um, the council didn't specifically request that. I know you and I have had probably so many discussions on that possibility that, you know, it, it, that has not been directly uh, discussed with council. The committee did address hybrid approaches. Um, after listening to Janesville today, we'll, I'll probably need to talk to you about what their thoughts are. They're trying to get rid of it. Uh, and when they use, when they talk about wanting to get rid of it, they do refer to it as a wheel tax, even though they know it's technically a fee. Um, there's pros and cons. It was fascinating to listen to their real experience with a registration fee 
and the inherent uh, flaws with it that the committee that Mr. Mugrauer, Ms. Allison Osby, and Mr. Ford, at one time or another, you were all in the committee that was kicking this around. Um, those, there are imperfections there, but um, that's not to say we aren't going to look at it. That's, that's not in R.H. Smith's wheelhouse. That would be back with us. Uh, Russ, I think it would be finance, don't you think? If we wanted to go to any type of hybrid, obviously that's a council decision, um, and we can certainly pull those numbers together, and we can get some go back as a rec. Um, uh, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Van Gogh, we're losing fee. you. You may want to take the video. Sorry. Yeah. Any better now? You know what I'm saying? As I was saying, though, we could um, we could certainly resurrect any type of potential income from motor vehicle registration or any other sources that kind of do a hybrid approach. Um, but I think um, we need to at least look at the feasibility of of compiling the data based on trip generation and what that might look like by itself and then decide if we want to consider any hybrid methods. Well, okay. for, for our purposes tonight, and I, I wasn't trying to take us down another path, but for our purposes tonight, I just wanted to know if that included uh, that or not. Um, and, and so the public is aware of that, that it is strictly for this item. Do we have any other discussion on the analysis? And, all right, can we please take the roll? Patanasi? Carlosi? Aye. Howard? Eric Smith? Eschel? Ford? Ford? Paul Mary? Carrie Seven. All right, next up, 20-492, approved 2021 stormwater utility rate uh, to 210.60 per ERU per year. We have a motion and a second. Deputy Mayor Krause and Council Mayor Ford, discussion. I believe this has been uh, discussed for the past several years. Looks like Council Member Ford and then Council Member Mugerauer. I just want to confirm with, with city staff so the public hears it that um, this increase is needed to fund what we had approved in our CIP, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Council Member Mugerauer. Mm. For the public at home, you know this is not not a fun approval. Uh, it's not a it's not something we want we want to do ever, but it's absolutely necessary in terms of maintaining and improving um, the investments that we've made. Uh, so maintaining those and improving you know, upon the uh, the infrastructure we have. Uh, as Councilmember Ford asked and got confirmed, you know, council goes through these deliberations every budget cycle. Uh, we approved the projects. Now it's time to find a way to pay for them. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't remind Council, um, since 2016, since uh, the last update was, or the last increase on this one was uh, April 1st of 2016, uh, we've seen a 54% increase in this rate, cumulative, over that time. That's a large cumulative increase. That's the largest uh, we have. Um, and I don't take that lightly, and I, I'm sure that my colleagues don't, but um, at some point uh, we will, we should need to have a conversation with Public Works in terms of um, at what point do we start seeing an end to a tunnel in terms of uh, large-scale increases to this fee structure. So uh, it's not now. I'm not, I'm not asking for it immediately, but I think at some point this council or the next council or so on needs to have that discussion in terms of um, when will this cost uh, plateau a bit for the taxpayers in Oshkosh. I think Mr. Van Goppel can partially answer that question. Um, 
I would yeah, draw your, your attention to page 244 in the agenda packet. And this is this was a you know probably brushed over a little bit when we presented this back in what was it August or September. But I think the answer to your question is in short 2027. And the reason uh, for that, and I and Russ, I think you talked to the mayor about this as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've been borrowing for a lot of these projects since I've been here. Um, I took over immediately in the aftermath of the terrible floods we had in June of 08. And we had these projects on the on our docket as they're in this presentation here in your agenda packet. Those had been there, but we weren't moving the needle. And so unfortunately, from a financial standpoint, we started to move the needle. Once we, and these borrowings are typically 20 years. Once we've hit 20 years worth of projects, that's when we plateau because we're gonna, we aren't adding new debt every year. We're, our, we're gonna equalize our, what debt we're picking on and what debt we're taking off. So you can see that it starts slowing down in 2025 to a 5% increase. And then in 2027, the projections zero increase, two and a half percent in 28, zero percent in 29. I think that's our plateau. And Russ, I don't know if you can add to that, uh, uh, to that comment, because that's what stuck out with me. And I was glad that the mayor asked, asked that question, because I believe you were asked that by what, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And uh, thank you, Mr. Van Goppel, for um, sharing that and, and city manager. Uh, as, as you know, I think we've all been feeling that pain on, on those monthly utility bills. Uh, certainly, um, you know, I, I don't think anybody would like to repeat, you know, what we experienced in 2008 and uh, what some of our surrounding communities have. So appreciate uh, the forecasting of when we can start to see a little bit of possible leveling out. And thanks to Councilmember Mugrauer for bringing that up. Uh, Madam Mayor. Council Member Allison Osby. I'm sorry, uh, did I hear somebody else? Yes, this is uh, Finance Director Van Gompel. Oh, yes. Uh, just to, to kind of touch on both of your comments, I'm, you know, we take this very serious and, and this is not nothing that we're trying to reach and grab for. This is, you know, as we said, this is all based on um, our investment in capital projects and what we have lined up, what we've done in the past, and the debt to uh, pay that off, and then what we have coming up in the in the horizon. So this is all based on projects that are identified specifically for uh, stormwater management. Um, and we have Ellers come in and, and take a look at what we really need to do to keep this um, funding viable for the projects that we have coming forward. So it, it is a very serious responsibility, and I want the public to be um, certain that we take this um, uh, obligation very seriously and, and look at uh, trying to minimize the necessity to have increases. And to that, to Russ's point, I would draw your attention to page 238, which shows all the projects we have identified for the entire decade of the 20s. And it just shows there are so many projects. And I think I, I had James put in the memo, we developed a 35-year plan back in 2006, 2007. James, isn't that about right? That was right about the time you, you joined us, right? And uh, we were working on the development when I when I joined the city, and I think we were just kind of getting ready to present it at the time you joined us. So we have a 35-year plan that we're about 12 years in. So we're about a third of the way in. But you can see that you know the next decade there are a lot of projects we have, and some of them are you know relatively small. But every year we've got a two or three million dollar project. Uh, that we're adding on. Now, as time goes on, some of those will slow down a little bit. But, you know, there's, I, I could read off all of them, but I, I would just, you know, it wouldn't be good to put on the screen because it's a lot, of, it's very small type. But we've got projects identified through the rest of this decade. And 
that's what these that's what these increases are going towards. We could slow down the growth of the rate. All you got to do is go to that 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 page and take away projects. I'm not going to recommend that. Um, I remember when I first got here, the newspaper uh, jokingly said I had an easy job because I had a mandate that the public was now behind. We needed to get storm water addressed. And we've been we pushed a lot of projects through, but we're not done. And I look at what's going on in Green Bay, and they have been ignoring it like we had been ignoring it. And you hear it all the time about the flooding on the east side of Green Bay because they don't have any of these types of projects that we started to do. We're lucky that we've had some good We've had some good years. Mother Nature's been kind to us, knock on wood, but we still have many more projects in our largest Sawyer Creek, but all the way through the city, and you can read through that list. This isn't just Sawyer Creek. This isn't just uh, one area of the north side. This is all over the city. And this is this is the list, Madam Mayor, that, that I think Russ or James are bringing with you uh, to talk to the chamber about so they understand this is this is about these projects. Councilmember Allison Osby. Actually, Mark uh, touched on a number of points. Was just you know adding some a little bit of historical perspective because infrastructure was something that had been delayed for a lot of decades. You know, not I would say in the last 10, 15 years, but certainly going going back. And you know, so when I moved into town. You know, 23 years ago, the thing that everybody talked about was, you know, the flooding that they were experiencing. And I agree with Mr. Louvrauer. You know, obviously, you know, it's an over 50% increase, you know, from 2016. And it is a big deal. And, and it is a lot um, to a lot of folks that are experiencing a number of other fees. But on the flip side, you know, in some ways, it is a bit incremental compared to what we were seeing in the past before we were dealing with the issues. I mean, and it wasn't just even like one solid torrential rain. It was if we had a wet season or in sometimes in, in retrospect, it, it wasn't even that much rain. And you would hear about folks that flood insurance, you know, flood insurance was not part of their, or flooding was not a part of their homeowner's insurance or their renter's insurance. And then, you know, they were out significant amounts of money. So we, we've come a long ways. And, and, and again, um, you know, we don't ever want history to repeat itself. So we are going to have to make these investments in infrastructure. And then even moving forward, when it levels out, we just want to make sure we keep up with it so that we don't fall back like we were, you know, when, as Mr. Roloff said, when he came on. And then, you know, we're borrowing really more than, than the public is comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I guess I just wanted to follow up with Mr. Robbie. Um, uh, you know, I don't know how many folks out there are aware that they can apply for stormwater credits uh, based on uh, green infrastructure in that. Um, Mr. Robbie, uh, obviously this is uh, not necessarily a 7%, you know, offset, but um, how many do you have a rough idea of how many folks have taken advantage of that? And, um, you know, just a reminder to, uh, I guess, instruct on how they can access those applications for stormwater credits. Numbers at my fingertips for the number of uh, credits that have been issued. Um, I can say that at the time the policy, in particular the residential policy was approved, uh, there was a, a big push, and a lot of people did apply. Uh, since that time, it, it certainly has um, dwindled. Um, you know, the application materials and the manuals for uh, the stormwater utility credit applications are all available on the stormwater page of the city's website. And you know, the manuals are there, the instructions are there, uh, the applicability requirements; uh, those are all there in that in those documents. But and thank a you. reminder to do more promo. Thank you. Yes, yes. And I know a sustainability advisory board last night just had a presentation by some UW Oshkosh students, um, and they gave some uh, very specific recommendations for our uh, sustainability website. So perhaps uh, that'll be an opportunity uh, on hot topics, I believe, um, 
Tony mentioned that we can connect them with how to find that information a little more readily. Would appreciate that. Um, all right, any other discussion? Please take the roll. Allison Osby. Okay. Move forward. Erickson. Aye. Heschel. Ford. Paul Mary. Aye. Gary Seven. All right, next is 20-493, approved base schedule for sewer use charges. Do we have a motion and a second, please? Council Member Ford and Erickson, thank you. Discussion. Seeing none, please. Oh, I'm sorry, did I miss somebody? All right, please take the roll. Allison Oski. Aye. Mugrower. Erickson. Heschel. Aye. Four. Aye. Paul Mary. Carry seven. All right. Four. Moving on to 20 494. Sorry about that. Uh, 494, approve the city of Oshkosh fee schedule. Do we have a motion and a second? Councilmember Mugrauer and Deputy Mayor Crosby. Discussion on the fee schedule. Councilmember Mugrauer. Appreciate finance putting this together. Uh, Russ and, and as a team just did a great job of getting this out to us. And, uh, thankfully, the increases aren't all that much um, in, in general. Um, but one thing I want to point out to my fellow colleagues is uh, 2021, um, hopefully, we get to have some special events. Hopefully, some things start uh, resembling what we used to call normal-ish. But uh, in 2021, uh, special event organizers are going to be paying full boat, full full cost for the equipment charges that are under the theme of rates that we have in here. Um, so previously to this, the last four years, there's been a discounted schedule, or, or maybe it was five. Um, this last year, 2020, would have been under the, I think, the 75% of full uh, of cost. 2021 is going to be full cost. Um, at our January meeting, uh, either the first or the second, I plan on bringing uh, information to that meeting to have a discussion on uh, uh, having a reduction in that rate for 2021 to help uh, help special event organizers if they are able to get off the ground to help them in any any way possible. I've been uh, I've not been quiet on on this issue in general. I think our special events fee structure is is not something that supports um, bringing a lot of unique um, activities to this town. And I think the equipment side of it is is what my my issue is with it. And so. Uh, in January, I'll be bringing uh, something forward in terms of of uh, giving some relief to those organizers. All right, uh, is Chief Stanley here? There's two fire department shields, so I assume he's one of them. Okay. Uh, I am, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. So we had a conversation about the um, ambulance fees and what appears to be some significant e increases in those ambulance fees. Uh, but as I understand it, uh, your explanation that it appears that way, but there may be some uh, bundling. Can you talk a little bit about uh, those ambulance fees? Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That as we discussed earlier, Today, that while it appears uh, fairly dramatic <clears throat> in the increases, but many of those ambulance fees have gone away. That our billing agent is LifeQuest. They did a um, market study, you know, and we were to, to increase some of those fees uh, at any rate. And then 
we had a lot of individualized fees. For example, you got charged for the ambulance trip, but then you got a separate fee for oxygen. Yeah. So one of the things that they recommended is that we bundle those rates. That's what a lot of departments around the country and EMS providers around the country are doing. You know, so while it, it's face value, it looks like it, the rate is higher. You know, it's not as dramatic because several of those fees we had used in the past have have dropped and they have rolled up into that bundle. Yeah, thanks for that explanation. And then it looks like um, there's some uh, some other relief there uh, with regard to um, participating in the fall prevention program. Would you want to just briefly talk about that a moment? Correct. I mean, one of the issues that we're really trying to address is fall prevention in our community. You know, that uh, we have astoundingly high numbers of falls. You know, so we want to uh, get as many people as we can involved in fall prevention evidence-based programs. So one of the uh, deterrents that, that we can use for continuing to rely on 911 services and just perpetually falling is by making the, the fee higher, you know, makes them a, uh, may make them more uncomfortable, and then we can provide the option of if you will participate in one of those evidence-based programs, which is our goal, then you will waive the fee. Thank you for sharing that. Are there other questions or discussion on the fee schedule? All right, please take the roll. Allison Osby. Crowley. Aye. Mugler Over. Aye. Erickson. Aye. Ashel. Aye. Ford. Aye. O'Mary. Carried seven. All right, and uh, the last item on new resolutions is 20-495 approved cooperative purchase of body cam service agreement to Axon Enterprise for Police Department. Um, $534,744.81. So do we have a motion and a second on 495? So moved. Deputy Mayor Crosby and Councilmember Mugrauer. All right, discussion on 495. I'm, I'm guessing Chief Smith is here with us. Council members, discussion? Uh, Chief, would you like to just share a little bit about what the expectation is uh, with this item? Well, this is a continuation of uh, our body cam program that we've had in place since 2016. Um, our, contra our current contract will expire in the first quarter uh, coming up in, Jan in January, February. And uh, what we will be doing is renewing our contract giving us unlimited data storage. But the, the exciting part about this is we're gonna be adding cameras to our program. We'll be adding cameras to all of our patrol supervisors, as well as our, as well as our, our detectives who have regular interaction with community members. Very good, thanks for sharing that. Any other questions for the chief? All right, please take, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Mugerauer. I'll slow on that one. Um, and it's really not a question, more of a brief statement for Chief and, and for the community. Um, I'm thankful that Chief Smith um, took the initiative several years ago to bring this to Council to make it a priority to, to fund. Um, I'm happy that um, we get to continue this this uh, program. It's important, obviously, with um and not so much just things nowadays, if you want to put that in air quotes, but um, in terms of just interactions with the public, it's important uh, to make sure that, um, you know, that we have those interactions recorded, that they are available for records requests. Um, it's a, a helpful tool for the citizens as much as it is for uh, our police officers. And uh, I appreciate Chief Smith's leadership on this one a few years ago, bringing it to us, and I'm, and I'm glad it's working well for the city of Oshkosh. So. Very much agreed. All right, please take the roll on 495. Allison Osby. Crowley. Aye. 
Ungerauer? Erickson? Aye. Satchel? Ford? Palmieri? Aye. Carry seven. All right, very good. Then we are now at uh, Council Discussion and Direction to City Manager and Future Agenda Items. And it looks like we have future workshops uh, that are not yet scheduled. Uh, for the joint workshop with the Oshkosh Area School District. City Manager? I don't have a date yet, but uh, they're focusing on a an off Tuesday council meeting or an off Wednesday school board meeting. So. Uh, it'll, it'll likely be late January, but we will let you know. Uh, we'll probably end up, you know, getting it to you uh, during this little bit of break between between council meetings. Okay. And next we have a naming donation, naming and donation policy, uh, council member four. Here. So I had emailed uh, the city manager about this um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm, I'm interested in naming a section of the uh, Riverwalk after uh, Lurton Blassingame. Um, he pioneered the, the idea and he really gave just so much to this community um, through the city and through other roles. Um, and I, I, like I said, I checked with Mark and our current policy calls for a, a five year period between when someone passes away and Lurton passed away earlier this year uh, before we can start start doing things like like naming rights. Um, and I, I don't want to violate that policy or anything, but I just wanted to get it on the record that I hope that five years from now that that's something that uh, that we do consider. So thank you, Mark, and thank you to the uh, to the city attorney for all the information as well. And that information's in your agenda packet for future reference because this was adopted before many of you were on the council. And uh, uh, City Attorney Lawrence has spent a great deal of time putting this together, and it's proven to be very successful. Uh, for donations. We don't get naming requests too often, but, uh, you know, I'll keep it on my radar, Council Member Ford, that's for sure. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I plan on being a pain about it, whether I'm in office or not. So. I'm not going to agree or disagree on that statement. <laughs> and thanks for sharing, yeah, thanks for sharing the um, actual policy. Uh, I had not seen that previously because it had not come up. And, and for folks who are interested in reading what that policy is, um, and certainly you can uh, contact City Hall as well if you have questions. All right, next we have council member announcements and statements, uh, report of council liaison for boards and commissions. Who would like to share first? Council member Allison Osby, did you mention that you had a quarterly report? And then perhaps Council Member Ford, it looks like you guys were right at the same time. Sure. Um, yeah, I like to I like to report uh, quarterly, and so I serve on three committees. So the first one is Committee on Aging. Uh, that is one for those that you know may not have remembered in the past that that is now a televised event, the first Tuesday morning of every month. And um, so just in this last quarter, some real noteworthy uh, items um, we did have. Winnebago County Health, they've come in on a couple of different things, but one of the ones that really stuck out in my mind, especially during this uh, point in time, is when it comes to our seniors, they did a great presentation on isolation and loneliness. Um, we've also had the Age and Disability Center report on age-friendly um, community projects, and then one that's really important, um, obviously, is fall protection and then keeping not only seniors, but also sometimes their caregivers um, not only information, but uh, prior to COVID, but even now, just um, resources for the seniors for that, because that is something that impacts our community quite a bit, and our, our fire department sees that a lot. Other notable items uh, is that um, typically we have somebody that gives a report if there's any bills that impact uh, down at the state level for seniors, scams targeting senior um, and COVID updates and community resources available to them. And then always this time of year, um, there's medical, med, Medicare uh, open enrollment information. Uh, then there's Landmarks Commission. Um, we did have a historic plaque application that they are carefully reviewing staff updates on the historic preservation plan. Um, also too, with this last historic plaque application came a discussion about reviewing the criteria 
for those plaques. And then uh, some of the members of the committee were able to participate virtually for a historic preservation conference. Um, so that was pretty neat. And then with the CVB, that of course has been um, actually, even despite the fact that there hasn't been a lot of uh, special events, certainly Amy and the staff have been busy there. Uh, they've been maintaining the support local Oshkosh Facebook group. Um, it gives local businesses a place to promote and then also uh, residents to uh, be able to give positive feedback about their experiences. Obviously, they're continuing the Love Oshkosh campaign, pushing uh, holidays in Oshkosh um, for shopping and keeping it local. And we will be voting on the budget tomorrow. Uh, it's no secret, obviously, that uh, with, without the room tax dollars, their budget has been incredibly limited. And then, um, you know, one positive, for sure, one positive thing, and uh, Miss Amy Albright reminded me of this by sending me a note just before council, was, um, you know, that we are receiving a $240,000 grant from the state of Wisconsin to help with some of the lost revenue that we've had. And that certainly will um, definitely, definitely help the CBB. So that's it for me. Thank you. Other council members that, uh, council member Ford, it looks like um, the plan commission had a lot of action this week. Yeah, we approved everything. So there's really not much, uh, not much to add that hasn't been, uh, hasn't been said today. Um, so yeah, but plan commission did meet and then long range finance met as well. Uh, council member Mugerauer might have something to add as well. Um, but among other things, we looked um, looked at a draft document for a budget development policy, and this is all part of the continuing effort to get our budgeting policies in place. Um, so really, so it'll help for continuity when we do have turnover within the organization. And I don't know if Councilmember Mugerauer has stuff to add as well. I can uh, add on just a little bit, and that'll satisfy my my part of it. Um, we also briefly discussed the interest rates in terms of special assessments and staff is going to continue uh, compiling information, bringing that back for us to, uh, to look at and discuss. All right. Very good. And I think other council members have been reporting as we go along uh, with their boards and commissions. So thank you for that. And then um, council member Allison Asby would like to um, speak to council regarding responsibility in responding to inquiries about local nonprofit agencies. Councilmember sure, Murphy. Sure, thank you. And this isn't it isn't just specifically for council. It's also a reminder to the community because obviously this year our businesses have been hit uh just incredibly hard. So, you know, besides the loss of revenue to the businesses, also employees that were impacted, whether they were furloughed, whether their uh, their employment, their employer closed, um, you know, maybe perhaps bonuses or typical pay that they would have has been cut back. And so the result of, of that, especially this year, has been um, certainly our nonprofits who really serve the needs of the community have been hit incredibly hard. And so, you know, just a couple couple reminders. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, they're stretched thin, not only dollar wise, but just, you know, physically bodies. With COVID, um, it seems like you know if they function a lot on volunteers or if they have a limited staff, you know, it's either staff has COVID or they're, um, you know, they're on quarantine. Same thing with volunteers. Uh, as well. And so, you know, everybody's stepping up and doing more than um, they typically do. And so one of, the, one of the concerns that comes up is sometimes with social media, you know, certainly we have well-meaning individuals that post, uh, you know, questions about why is something happening or not, not happening. And I just, you know, want to put a reminder out for the community and also for city council members that, you know, we always want to engage and we always want to be concerned about citizen inquiries when, you know, maybe it looks as if perhaps a nonprofit is, is maybe not participating um, in some manner. And typically we don't always know the, the full story. And when, when we serve populations, our nonprofits do have policies and procedures. We have rules for a reason. And so, you know, just, you know, make sure that, you know, rather than 
possibly fueling the fire is making sure that you're contacting the executive director. If the executive director is not available, you know, certainly contact the lead staff person. Uh, but at a time that, you know, everybody is stretched really thin, I think it's important to make sure, you know, that we're, we're always assuming positive intent first and foremost, uh, making sure, you know, that we understand um, that there may be other circumstances or extenuating circumstances um, and that maybe sometimes the proper question is how can we help versus, you know, condemning or being overly critical before we know the whole story. And that was way more preachy than I intended it to be. Well, you know, we all need a good sermon every now and then, but thanks for sharing. And it's a good reminder for all of us, uh, myself included. Council Member Ford? Yeah. I, when you were talking there, um, <laughs> Uh, Councilwoman uh, Allison Osby, it, it reminded me of something you said earlier tonight about um, kind of this virtual world we're living in and the communication challenges uh, it is it is bringing. And I think that uh, that's just a nice a nice reminder that we all need to be need to be mindful about how we communicate with one another and in the community because it's yeah we're in this weird virtual space we don't have that one on one interaction that we're used to. But anyways. All right, all uh, right, then we are at city manager announcements and statements. City manager, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, there's a number of items in your agenda packet regarding uh, with memos regarding contracts that we've entered into that uh, by code require that I uh, report them to council. A lot of having to do with stormwater services, a lot of things for things for 2021. Uh, that we've entered into to get the ball rolling on um, floodplain mapping, uh, site plan review services, things of a general nature that uh, that occur every year. Uh, item 40 is the R.A. Smith contract that we referenced earlier with council approval of the funding for that, uh, that user fee model. So we'll be working on that uh, very shortly with R.A. Smith. Um, and uh, there's also our commercial assessment services, uh, as well as our cooperative purchases of computers for 2021. Happy to answer any questions that you may have about those. Um, if not, I am happy to point out with item number 41, we are yeah, recognizing yeah. our 19th Neighborhood Association, uh, Historic Fourth Ward, which had previously been known uh, in, in previous life as the Near East Neighborhood. Um, I think that's a cooler name, the Historic Fourth Ward. Happy to have them join the, uh, the, the 18 other neighborhood associations, and we are always willing to talk to folks who are interested in forming neighborhood associations. The fact that they form these groups uh, while they're socially distant, they're doing this all on Zoom and things like that. I mean, my hat's off to these neighborhood associations for staying vibrant and relevant uh, during some difficult times. So real happy to report that out. Um, um, Committee Manager, are you able to just show, or uh, is maybe uh, Tony able to show that map that's in our packet that shows where the historic Fourth Ward Neighborhood Association is located? Tony, Tony, that would be page 326. I don't know if you can do that, but if you can, it's 326. But it's Irving. It's Irving to Merritt and Broad to Jefferson. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you can't show it, that's okay. I just thought if it was easy. Nope, it's coming up. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Are you seeing it? Not yet. There, there it you is. Go. You can scroll a little bit, Tony. Is there any way you can scroll that a little bit? There we go. So, so it looks like it's, it's just south of the Midtown Neighborhood Association and neighbor uh, across the street from Middle Village. And immediately west of Menominee South. So. A lot of neighborhood associations, great involvement. And I'm also proud of, you know, uh, Oshkosh uh, neighborhoods 
welcoming them. The, the other neighborhood associations are so cool about reaching out and, hey, if you need a hand with this, let me help. Um, very much, uh, you know, a, a collaborative process. So real excited about that and happy to report that. And then um, finally, I've got the list of outstanding issues. Um, so uh, with the holidays, it's been slow, but uh, few, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have that we have in there. And uh, otherwise, we'll just give you a brief COVID-19 update. Um, Yes, I, I think uh, there was a question about when we might uh, be looking at that follow-up discussion on the transition, uh, the TLP, um, or the discussion about a potential review on that matter. Yeah, I I don't. Oh, look Mark, at, look if I can wave in a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, um, Alan and I and Mark Lyons met on Monday. We're putting together um, just some last bits of information. We were hoping to get it to Mark Roloff in the next, um, hopefully by the end of the week, maybe not till next week. Depends how long it takes to, to pull that last little bit together. And then we would get an update to the council after we have a chance to run through it with Mark. Oh, wow, you guys are way ahead of what we thought. I think we were looking at, like, January okay, of we'll wait. We can hold off. But <laughs> They're no, motivated we were... to go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say it's working great. Uh, and I think everybody recognizes that council is deeply concerned that we have. We still haven't heard anything that the state is uh, planning imminently to do another facility, but I think we know in our guts that it's it's going to happen at some point in the future, and we want to be ready so that you have something in place that everybody understands, and uh, and we can we can avoid some of the uh, uh, concerns that, uh, that uh, the neighborhood right now is dealing with. Well, and I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that prompted me to ask about that is, remind me again, and maybe council members, would we also be in that greater discussion be talking about what the county uh, challenges are for the 980 placements that's also, while it's separate from the, the transitional uh, scenario that we talked about previously, are we going to be talking about that together or separate? When you say together, do you mean with the Department of Corrections or with the county? Both. Both. We don't have anything to do with that. Okay. This is primarily the, the transitional housing, uh, the, the true TLPs, not the 980s. Um, you know, we recognize that, you know, I, I think the location that the county has for the 980s is about as good as you could ask for. Unfortunately, though, though, they're still in Oshkosh, and I, I think we want to make sure that the county is looking at alternative sites. Uh, um, they're really getting forced. With the 980, they're really getting forced. Um, uh, I can certainly talk to um, County Executive here about where, where they think this is going. Um, I, I, I just know that the demand is going to go up because as 980s get released, they're going to have to, they are not the same. They cannot go to these mm -hmm. traditional housing sites. I think Chief has been very, very direct with the Department of Corrections that 980 offenders do not belong in these places such as Jefferson Street. And if we were going to do a new place, we wouldn't want them there either. Where they've got them up near, near the landfill there, the county garage, it just makes more sense. All right. So I will go to that, Madam Mayor, and, and look at that. And you said we also and have then, the COVID updates? Uh, yeah, the, um, you know, in terms of the state level, they're looking at some things that may or may not impact our ability to do things. Um, so we're we're keeping an eye on that. The governor has changed a lot of his two advisories. Um, 
I don't think things have gotten bad that it's just an advisory. Um, we're still doing everything we can to educate, appreciate all the work that uh, Amy Albright with the Convention Visitors Bureau is still doing with um, promoting uh, the uh, uh, Love Oshkosh campaign. Um, but right now, on the regulatory side, I think is as is, is, is good as we can get. We just have to keep pushing people to follow the basics. You know, I, I talked about this here at, at the office with our employees, and places of work are almost like safe haven. But when people, if they continue to go out and continue to have big events, Madam Mayor, you put a, a photo for Friday night, um, wrestling at the Mason. Uh, um, I'm not joking. I wish I was. Um, and those events, um, you know, they're, they're going to spread the virus. And they're not masked. Even if they are masked, if they're so close to each other, I mean, you're yelling and screaming at these events. Um, they're, they're just problems. Most places are doing a very good job, and that's what we want to focus on. But we have to recognize that those outliers are what keep this community spread going. So that's uh, that's that side of it. Um, I'm happy to report that City Hall is open. Um, we are planning to mail out our tax bill at the end of this week, so tax collection will start following me. We're still encouraging people to um, use alternatives just like they did with voting. You do not need to come in to pay your bill. We will accommodate you if you choose to but we're going to do everything we can to encourage you to go to those other those other methods. With respect to virtual meetings, you know, council meetings are done for the for the for the month for the year, as are most of the committees after next week. Um, but staff is in a position where we need to start putting out notices for for meetings and that. So I've made the decision that we need to extend the virtual meetings through January until we see how the holidays work themselves out. We're doing, I think Mr. Davis was the one who pointed out to me, he's doing notices this week, and we have to be able to tell people it will be virtual or or, or what other way we're doing it. I think we need to get those out sooner rather than later, especially with the holidays. So um, what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that the meetings are going virtual. The, Precautions we've taken in the buildings, I think are very good. I feel very comfortable as an employee, not just because I'm the manager and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making the decision on that. I think people feel that we're doing everything we can. There are instances where people aren't following the rules. Uh, there was a concern that we were directing people to come in when they're sick. We do not and we won't. And I will address that immediately. We do not do that. But some employees are like, it's just a cough. You know, it's just a lot of stuff, and then it's COVID. <laughs> so if you're feeling sick, we're saying stay home. Um, but some people haven't done that, and we need to have discussions with them before they become uh, sick. So we're, we're struggling just like every other employer on that. Uh, I think we've got a decent message, but we're not perfect, and we're working on that. Um, and we're going to continue to work on that. But as far as public meetings go, you know, there there may not be a lot of folks, but when there are, I think the plan commission has seen some traffic through some of their meetings. Um, you never know when the item is going to attract attention. Um, you know, I thought, quite honestly, there would be more people tonight with Jackson Street. If we had that, we would have had a very challenging room. I want to keep it through January, and I'll report to you on January 12th what we're looking at uh, post-holidays. Chief Stanley, uh, anything to add to that? No, sir. No. Could I ask um, either of you, um, has, has the city been contacted yet about the hub and spoke model uh, for the vaccination distribution in, in terms of some of the logistical, um, or is that going directly from uh, to public health? Have, do we have any information on that yet? 
not details, not but it was discussed just this morning at our weekly EOC. Chief? Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, the city has not got information about that. That you know, when that occurs, that'll be routed through public health. You know, from but the I, I guess from the point was that there's not going to be just one location that's not going to be effective or efficient in getting uh, vaccinations out, out. So I'm not. I think I understood what you meant by hub and spoke. But the idea is not just oh, we'll have one central location for vaccinations and we'll have a line that's five miles long. The idea will be to have multiple destinations, perhaps even try to work with large employers. We want to get, when we get this vaccine, we want to get out, but it's going to be public health and the medical folks working all that out. We're not going to be specifically part of it, but, you know, I can commit to you that if they need a facility and we've got a facility, we're going to provide it. I mean, that's, we have to do that. Uh, I was so encouraged by seeing that little old lady in the UK get, get her first vaccination today. We're on our way, um, helps on the way, but stay safe in the meantime. It doesn't mean the party isn't, you know, we can't pop the corks yet, um, but there is hope uh, upcoming and, and we'll be part of it, however we but right now we haven't been asked. Is that fair way to say, Chief? Yes. Correct. Still way too early on. Well, thank you for that update. Yeah. And uh, we are at the end of our last meeting for 2020. I just want to say before we get a motion to adjourn, thank you to all of my fellow council members, uh, to city staff. Um, you know, 2021 will come in with some super Oshkosh resilience, and uh, I hope that everybody will stay safe through the holidays. And certainly, um, this has been a challenging year, but um, I've been very honored to serve with you in a very trying time. With that, do we have a motion to adjourn? All right, all in favor, uh, we need a voice vote. Our roll call on that. Allison Asti? Aye. Charlesy? Mugrower? Jerkson? Heschel? Ford? Aye. Paul Mary? Carrie, we are adjourned. <laughs>